So finally, I'm very excited to introduce today's guest, Amy Nurnberger. Um, Amy is the Program Head for Data Management Services at MIT Libraries, and she also serves as an Adjunct Assistant Professor in the Learning Analytics Program at Teachers College, Columbia University. Um, within the broader research data community, Amy is also the co-chair of the Research Data Alliance, Education and Training on Handling Research Data Interest Group, and is the elected co-chair of the RDA Organizational Advisory Board. And she sits on the ACRL Research and Scholarly Environment Committee. So it's great to have you here, Amy, and I'll stop sharing and hand it over to you. Great, thank you. And I will start sharing my screen. Okay. Um, I I hope we're good. If we're not good, someone uh, someone give me a chat. But assuming that we are, thank you very much for the invitation to speak with you today. Um, I'm very happy to have been invited and very honored to be talking about this idea of leveraging campus connections for research data management. This is, a, this is something that is, is not a, a singular or individual challenge. It's something I know we, we all work with, trying to bring different campus points together to support efforts around research data management. So, Within this space, um, some of the things that I'd like to talk about today are, first of all, this was really driven by uh, a meeting that was held in October between AAU and um, APLU, which are the main organizations for our public and private universities. Uh, it's where our, our provosts go to talk to each other and our presidents. Um, this was an NSF-sponsored meeting. Um, and then drawing out of that kind of what are some of the themes that were discussed? Um, what are some, some things that are really great? What are some things that, that may cause some questions? Uh, moving from that to identifying some of the local conditions and campus connections that, that we can discover and use to move some of these goals forward. And then just some of the examples from uh, my own experiences um, and my team's experiences at MIT was trying to, to, to build these connections and, and put different programs in place that are leveraging those. Um, with that then, so this is a, a press of the, the meeting that was held. Um, there's a brief report, you can find it on CNI. But this is really a, a landmark meeting where, you know, building on the, the NSF requirement in 2013 for uh, open access to articles and to their data, there's actually been a lot more conversation around open access to articles, especially on a university and administrative level. We've seen different universities come forward with open access policies. There's been a strong emphasis on uh, repositories for articles. And data has consistently lagged a little bit behind that front. Uh, so it was really nice to see that NSF sponsored this meeting to bring the Association of American Universities and the Association of Public and Land Grant Universities together at a level to start really thinking about what it means to accelerate access to the research data behind these publications as well. This was driven by work of the public access working group that came out of these two organizations. And then also instrumentally, the National Academy's report on open science by design. It's a fascinating report to read if, if you want to set aside a good chunk of time. Um, there's also a summary that gives you a little bit more of a snapshot of it if, if you have somewhat less than the time to dedicate reading some 200 pages um, of, that, of that report. I would recommend both, however. So within this report and coming out of this workshop, there were a couple of areas that were, I think, a really positive for 
data management and pursuing data efforts and reproducible research at our institutions. And there were a couple of areas that were maybe not so, maybe left some questions hanging in the air, if we say. So some of the things I was really excited to see uh, called out as themes from this meeting was a direct attention from administration, recognizing that yes, data is an asset of our research universities, that there is a value in research data, even if it's not associated with an article, uh, that there is a value to, be able to being able to access that data. And there are also some accompanying challenges when we talk about access in broad terms of what access is. And then also the importance of research data management to actually create data that it's kind of worthwhile to access, right? That's worthwhile to, to share and provide, uh, provide to other people. There's also the idea that there was, there was an emphasis and a theme emerged in this, in this October meeting that it's important to train, to train students in public access and open science. And I know that in many of our libraries, we've been, we've been working on doing that. Um, I know from the work that I've done with the Research Data Alliance that trying to, to find the terms and find the places for providing effective training to the many different groups of students across our institutions has been something that we've been pulling together to do to, to take advantage of the resources that are available and to really streamline the idea of what is effective in getting these ideas from in our students' practices. Um, there was another theme that was really about using the evidence that's provided by data management plans. And this is, this is great because we know that there's a lot of information that's wrapped up in data management that with the exception of a few studies that have been done in collaboration between five or six universities to look at a handful of their data management plans, a lot of this information has been hidden um, about how researchers are thinking about sharing their data, storing their data, managing their data, um, what, what types of data, what, what are their data stores. And then finally, the acknowledgement that success within this space is going to require collaboration. And this is a very important point because it recognizes that, that despite the American system of higher education, our institutions don't stand alone. And this is something that, that libraries in the past, I think this idea of, of collaborations, of coalitions is something that we're good at. We've built those things and we're ready to activate those things to build on this collaboration around the challenges of research data management. Some of the things in the, the report and uh, the, the workshop as well that made me, made me go, hmm, a little bit to balance out some of those hoorays was the, uh, the theme that emerged for the one-stop, low-barrier, seamless support for all of the research services. Um, of course, this is the dream. Uh, there's also a little touch of magic in that to achieve that. And I think the, the inherent difficulties in, in achieving that dream uh, maybe we're, we're kind of glossed over a little bit. Uh, another area of question is there was a lot of emphasis on in the workshop, um, working group, more than the report, on open science over reproducible science. And we all know that open science isn't the same as reproducible science. You can share all the bad science and, and poor research and and uh, poorly documented data that you like, and it, it is fully open, but that doesn't mean it's reproducible. And the idea that there needs to be a balance between those two areas is something that, that wasn't as prevalent in the, in the themes that emerged from the working group. It is much more prevalent in that uh, very long report about uh, doing science that is open as, as you go along and do it. And um, there's the assumption in there that some open science is reproducible science. One of the other areas is um, 
that there was a focus on the research itself without necessarily considering the research system, so the system that our research exists in. And this isn't just the, the institutions. This is also, it's the institutions, it's the funders, it's the publishers, it's the pressure that has produced the environment that we find ourselves in today, the scholarly environment that we find ourselves in today, where we are coming back to the idea of open science as a thing we should be doing when, in truth, open science is kind of the maybe the way we should have been doing things for quite some time now if we look at the history of Western science. And I think that oh, this is one of my areas of question because we're not going to get to that point of open science just focusing on the research or the researchers themselves, we need to consider the entire scholarly system and the research record. And then finally, again, somewhat of a glossing over about what will it actually take to do some of these things that are being proposed? What are the actual resource needs for all of the things? Uh, frequently, as libraries, as librarians, we're we want to step in and help out and contribute. And this becomes a problem because at the same time as libraries, as librarians, we know that our budgets are frequently being cut. And there's, there's that struggle there. There's that tension that bringing open science into being isn't something that is magic. It is something that takes investment in infrastructure, in people. Um, in those in in that time to develop effective systems that are going to support open science and open research so that's coming out of out of that report and really driving um, some of the ideas coming on because one of the one of the points in in resourcing goes back to to what I was saying before about coalitions and this is is something else that they did emphasize was that importance of collaboration and here were some of the cross institutional collaboration efforts that were called out specifically in the working meeting the um, data curation network uh, the pub which is a, a network of libraries and universities um, being put together to assist in curatorial efforts for data, um, knowing that not everyone has the expertise in a specific disciplinary or subject area to perform um, the curatorial activities that are necessary for a data set, being able to create a network of resources where data can be appropriately documented. Um, the public access submission system. This is much more in the vein of handling open access for publications at this point in time than data, but it's meant to be a, a one doorway to to all of the all of the uh, compliance requirements within uh, with with different funders. So, kind of, if if you submit your paper through this, it will go to the repository and it will notify the funders that that you've you've uh, you've put your your paper in the repositories and you you've checked your mark that um, all of your obligations have been met and then finally the joint roadmap for open science tools which is a really nice uh, effort of bringing together all of those tools that exist and continue to be developed that do work towards and encourage the practice of open science and open research so Within this, it's it's nice to think about those cross-institutional collaborations, but it leaves that idea of intra-institutional collaborations a little vacant still. We're left with, with questions about how to create those collaborations, how to leverage those positions, right? Thinking about, first of all, who are our stakeholders within an institution? Who should we go talk to? when we're thinking about research data management and trying to move some of these things forward like that, especially like that magical, uh, that frictionless one-stop experience for, for all of the research things. Uh, one place to, to start looking at this, and here are some starting points with that, is, you know, I always think about who is going to care about data. Um, about research data. And one of the first things that come up is the institution itself that you're working for. Because oftentimes it comes back to that institution as part of their mission to 
share the information that's developed, the knowledge that's developed outside of the institutional bounds. It also is something where it's a matter of reputation for the institution, looking at how impact is enhanced for researchers who have shared their data, who have participated in open science, who have been effectively partnered with through research data management. Um, one of my favorite examples of this is the Technical University of Delft, whose provost felt that research data management and open research were sufficiently important that he created um, three or four different what are known as data champion, or excuse me, data steward positions that are owned by each of the schools within the university and are coordinated by the library. And this is this is what I mean as, as a starting point to talk. This is, this is a matter of importance to the Institute itself. One of your other meeting places is, of course, the Office of Research. You'll find really concerned people there around research compliance, who great to partner with um, for myself personally, love compliance people, don't personally enjoy being a compliance person. So thinking carefully about those terms of partnership with the compliance officer. Um, another one is the, the IRB, and this is a very important point to point of communication because we know so often what's done in IRB can really control what can be done with the data coming out the other side of the research, right? If, if your researcher comes to the IRB with a, a, an amount of concern for the human participants where they promise those participants that their data is going to be destroyed or within a short amount of time or their data will only be used for this study. This is often in conflict with what the expectations of the funders might be or of the publishing journals might be. So starting those conversations with the IRB about what reasonable risk assessments are for different studies and understanding how the assessments impact the, the continuation of that research and the furtherance of those research lines. Um, the Office of Sponsored Projects, of course, is, is a huge stop because we start talking about grants and we start talking about money. And we also start talking about data management plans. And it goes back to the idea that if you have access or can get get some level of access to your data management plans, this starts giving you a wonderful view of what's going on within your institution when it comes, when it comes to data, when it comes to research data management. Um, and often, you know, the sponsored projects people are also going to start taking interest in exactly what promises are being made in those grant applications on behalf of the institution through the data management plan. Information technology and compute services is a great point of leverage because they, they work with you to provide the tools, to provide the storage. They can also point researchers in your direction and, and starting those conversations with, with those people um, can be very, very useful because, because of those reasons. Um, the people I found very useful to work in partnership with, whether talking about storage, um, secure storage, thinking more broadly about compute services, how that works with research data management, what can we put in place with the compute services that support research data management practices, positive practices. Departments themselves often are a great place to, to talk to and to talk from for to, to connect with the faculty because your department head might have uh, an overwhelming concern with the data, um, with how research is being approached. And they can, they can be a good contact there. Of course, the research community and the faculty uh, at a one-on-one -on, -one on an individual level. The faculty voice is such a strong voice in most of our institutions institutions, that finding a few faculty in sympathy with the, the services, the philosophies, the, the reasons behind good research data management can be some of the most important conversations that you have and, and really make great jumping off points for starting some of these other conversations with other people in the administration as well. And finally, the library itself, talking to other people within the library, 
Many times we find ourselves siloed uh, within our, our, our small area within the library, but there are so many people across the library that interact with research data in different aspects, whether it's talking to other faculty members or providing storage space for research data, or they work with a repository. These are all good people to connect with as well who can help support and amplify the message of research data management across the institution. Um, one of the, the things that, you know, we've had research data management has been a, a growing concern and many of us have had the opportunity to go out and talk with our talk with our organizations and, and maybe talk with our researchers. Uh, but things are changing. And so that that AAU meeting with APLU brings new attention and will I think will continue to bring attention back to the issue of data again that gives us this opportunity to go back to our research community, go back to our administration and just uh, talk with them about how is this open research thing going with you? Um, just to ask what's going well, what would you like to change? Where do you feel pain? Because oftentimes these are, these are places where there's not a realization that research data management or data management services have the facility and ability to help with some of these areas of pain, either already or that our research data management and data management services are willing to invest in actively changing some of these areas where people would like to see change and that we would be really good partners for advocating for those types of changes. Um, the one thing I would say is if you're thinking about doing a survey of your researchers to find out what their needs are with research data, there are a lot of papers that have been published on that. Um, most of them say pretty much the same thing well, we might be seeing some variants right now where emphasis is shifting a little bit from storage to maybe compute services. Really, these, these answers tend to line up the same. And so if you do feel it's necessary to go out and do a survey of your research community about their research data needs, I would encourage you to go back and look at a previous study to see if you can use their survey so we can start thinking about uh, meta-analysis of some of our results across institutions because that's something that's very difficult to do with the results that we currently have. Um, so one of the examples I really like about, I think, an institution that has done this coordination of resources well across the institution is the is the Göttingen research is the Göttingen University in um, Germany, and they've developed something that they call the E Research Alliance, and you can see that it brings in uh, a lot of different areas, right? It brings in the libraries, the research departments, the the campus administration itself, their medical informatics group. Um, if I didn't say library, I'm going to say library again because they're really the driving force behind this e-research alliance. And you can see what they've been able to, to build and support within this space by actively leveraging an alliance between these five different areas at the Göttingen Institution and within the libraries. I personally find it really impressive and uh, I really admire what they've done and also the governance that they've been able to establish around that. So with that ideal in mind, I'd like to talk about some of the things that we've done um, at MIT in order to, to, to push some of these, these ideas forward, some of these goals forward that came out in the AU, APLU around research and research data management. So one of the efforts we've been working on is what we've called the Campus Research Network. And this really focuses around brokering campus services as well as taking advantage of the position that libraries have with um, networking across across the campus and, and thinking about what, what have libraries been good at. And one of those things is building relationships um, finding services and creating access to those services. So we've been working on, first of all, 
mapping out the landscape of what services uh, actually exist at MIT. And in doing this, we were thinking not so much of enterprise services, but those smaller services that are offered within departments or large research centers where those the people who are offering those services are willing to create access to them um, for other people on campus, for other researchers on campus. And so in the effort of working through this project, we discovered that it really expanded beyond just the campus networking to really include ideas of an expert network because we have those people who are expert in using and advising on those services. Um, a lot of the services have to do with infrastructure. What are the infrastructure elements that are available, um, whether it's storage services or compute services or specific analysis applications that, that are just available in that one area. Um, and then also collaboration, because it takes collaboration between all of these different parts to really start making a network out of the whole. And while it's, I don't think it's going to, to end up being that, that magical place of, of one-stop service, what my hope for it is, is that we will be able to implement something that at least lets our researchers know an extent of what services are available to them and how they might be accessed across, across the institution. Um, this is something that, that we find particularly challenging because MIT hasn't, by its by its history hasn't necessarily been um, a place that enterprise services have worked well at because people always want to build their own that's a little bit better for their application than the enterprise service would be so we do have a lot of nodules spread across the institute that specialize in in particular applications uh, so so thinking of ways that we can we can broker services between between researchers and between service providers on the campus, as well as identifying those experts with those services. That has been a large part of, of trying to build out the idea of what the campus research network could be and how we might facilitate researchers effectively taking advantage of that network and, and passing themselves through it. Um, one of the other items that, that came out um, or, or, or that's in discussion right now is a research data registry. And uh, I, I just got the notification in my email today myself that there are new uh, recommendations that are coming forward from the MIT's Open Access Task Force. And this was one of their recommendations, is a registry for the research data that are produced at MIT. Uh, really to, to in part answer that question of what research data do we make anyway, but also to help us uh, provide access to those data. Um, the data registry itself is not meant to house or store the data, but really meant to be a directory of data, acknowledging that data lives in all sorts of different places and probably more important than directly controlling it is actually knowing what all the data are and where all the data are. And some of the things we've, we're looking at with this are the challenges of coordinating um, between IT services, departments, a variety of research initiatives, the Office of Sponsored Projects, and a whole lot more because where our stakeholders are in this is really within um, anyone who's concerned with funder requirements, so this is our Office of Sponsored Projects, thinking about how to implement this, which implicates our IT services, as well as a vast amount of collaboration with our faculty and with the departments, labs, and um, the centers to encourage the research faculty and the research community to actually participate in registering their data, thinking about ways to make that registration of the data as automatic and painless as possible. Of course, in thinking about, about this registry, uh, we're going to have to really look closely at developing and adapting, adopting 
metadata standards that are out there. It also hits on topics of citability, on data sharing, and again, comes down very heavily within the area of research data management because ultimately we want the data to have been managed well before it hits the registry because we want the data that's being publicized, showcased, that we are through the registry going to be indicating at least how you might access it, be data that can be accessed effectively, that can be used effectively, that can be trusted. Um, so this is a really exciting area for us. Uh, we're, we're right on the cusp of, of moving forward for this. And if other people are also in the midst of developing these re data registries or have already developed one, I would really love to hear from you about what your experiences have been in, in building that data registry and, and what your learnings have been. Right now we're seeing it as a really good opportunity to, to have conversations across the Institute and also to increase the understanding of that, that broader definition that we often use within research data management of what research data is, that it's, as we, it's not just the data files, it's so much more um, that, that's required there. Uh, one of the, the other areas, and this is the last example um, I'll be talking about, is the GIS and Data Lab that we launched um, beginning of this year, um, or, yeah, beginning of this year, um, middle, middle of last year. Uh, and this was in an effort to bring together uh, GIS and statistical services with research data management into a single physical space that was also completely open and accessible to our institute population. Um, and this was really motivated by the idea of making the most of GIS and DMS. How can we make experts available to the community? How can GIS and data management services work together to enhance each other? And, and what we've realized that we're working on here experts that exist within GIS and DMS because the the entire space is open it it exists of of three areas um, there's the there's the open study space there are the 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 oh my gosh those are amazing computer space and then there are also the the staff cubicles which uh, which are within this this space that's continually accessible to to library users uh, so making sure that those experts are accessible to our research community um, has really increased our consultations and our interactions. We hold office hours regularly alongside with our GIS partners, and we feed off of each other um, so that when someone is talking to the GIS people and statistical services people about their research project, you know, being good colleagues, they then say, but you probably also need to think about how you're managing all of these data. And we have data management service pe data management services people right here to help you out with your research data management in the space of this project. It also touches on research methods through the statistical services. And the project part participation has been really fascinating with this because we've had some really nice uh, individual projects we've been able to work on with drones. And now we're bringing um, the drone data into some of our Geo Blacklight instance, as well as looking at how that original data can be stored on Dataverse and having those all connect up with each other in a way so that we can take this individual project we were involved with from the GIS perspective and demonstrate good research data management and sharing of those data, man of those data, of those images to a broader population. One of our other areas within this space is, I, th I think we've gone with the name XR because there's virtual reality, there's augmented reality, and who knows how many other realities we might exist in. But, but working with those projects to realize the challenges around what that data consists of and what management of that data means. Um, of course, there's 
bringing research data management in through data management services. And then the space itself gives us, gives, gives us the opportunity to both offer standard uh, courses around GIS, around managing and working with data, as well as more tailored courses because we have this space that we can schedule but that's open and people can experience at the same time it makes it possible to have it dedicated to a specific class for a specific time if people need to use that equipment or those materials for that and finally because of the computers that are in the space because of the vr equipment there's also a hint of infrastructure in there and this has been really interesting seeing how the space has developed from our initial expectations and developed in ways that we hadn't anticipated but that have been really exciting um so i think that yes that wraps up kind of what i wanted to talk with you about today and some of the experiences I wanted to share. I'm really interested in hearing back from you about your experiences in where you found it useful to, to, to think about leveraging some of those connections across your universities, across your institutions and campuses, and, and what your experiences have been in this area. So thank you very much for that. I think I am going to stop sharing now and we can, we can take a look at questions if there are any questions. Thank you so much, Amy. That was wonderful. And we'll let we'll give people a moment to enter their questions in the chat. Um, I could start with one question, although it may be too specific, but I liked that you were mentioning the survey. I think a lot of universities get that idea like, oh, great, we'll just do a survey to figure out what our faculty are interested in. And there have already been so many surveys. But are there any in particular that you have noticed that you'd recommend or even just going in a, um, any directions you could point in for examples? I, yes, actually, there, I believe there is a paper out, um, one of the authors is Abigail Gobin, that attempted to do a meta-analysis of these campus surveys about research data, and I would point you directly to that one. I don't have the citation off the top of my head, but I would be happy to look it up. She goes, uh, she and her, her author partner um, go through and name which papers they look at. They look at the different survey questions. They point out what they think are valuable questions that have been asked and um, indicate, you know, what are some pathways to follow for standardizing some of these surveys so that we actually could do an effective meta-analysis at some point later in time? Um, to, to be honest, most, most institutions come back with saying, gosh, it would be nice if the researchers come back and say, it would be nice if the institute would give us, would give us more storage space because that's really expensive. <laughs> it may have been the one with Tina Griffin, I don't remember. Yes, and um, I, but I, I love that meta-analysis as well. <laughs> That's a great idea. Yeah. It's, if, you know, there's no reason we can't do research that, as, as libraries, that is more than a phenomenology, that we can expand on those. And it's something I would really like to see library research advance in these areas, especially I think we have the opportunity with research data to start thinking about some of these areas a little bit differently. Um, Canada, their portage network at one point was also working on a standardized survey. I'm not sure where that effort has gotten to, but it might be something worth looking into. It looks like there was also another question. How have you approached reluctant partners? Which that's also a good question. I share that as well. <laughs> it's it's an excellent question because we always have reluctant partners um, and, and they take all, all shapes. Uh, but it is through those questions of understanding where they are feeling pain, um, meeting 
those partners where they are. And sometimes it's even using the language that those partners use. Um, I've, I, I certainly stumbled early on trying to talk with humanists about data, and I was roundly informed that, thank you very much, humanists did not have data. They had many other things that I would think about as data, but they certainly did not call it data. So it, it required a shift on my part to, to, to meet them where they were in their thought process around this idea of research information. Um, and about how research was structured and how research is carried out. But it is in part that that listening point um, and listening, being willing to listen into what their pain points are and how they are expressing those points of pain, because it might not be in the language that we're used to to hearing as well, if, if that makes sense. Yes, that. well, we have a couple other questions. Uh, first, do you have any suggestions for those of us who are trying to work in universities where there is little, little in the way of top-down pressure or guidance to create those collaborations? That's a great question because I, I would venture to say that I think most of us work in exactly that environment is where it, if anything, we're, we're trying to maybe create some of that pressure because it, it sure would open, help to open some of those doors for us. Uh, but for that, I found it personally useful to think about and to bring up the points where, where research data and research data management open resource research is going to make their lives better and not just that kind of altruistic betterness of gosh wouldn't it be great for humanity if you shared your research data but how specifically it's going to make their life better so for a researcher it's that idea of maybe increasing impact or more of being more effective and efficient um, uh, there are there are many researchers who come around to this idea of, of having protocols and procedures for research data management because they've had just ha they've just had one too many grad students leave with their data in a mess that no one can understand and it either takes a lot of time to sort it out or the work has to be redone. Um, from a more administrative point, uh, with the compliance office, it is an important uh, point to talk about integrity of research and what that means to the university itself that being able to be in a positive position to defend a researcher when questions are raised is a good position to be in, that you have the data, that you've had those principles in place. So thinking about where it's going to to make a difference in their life. And then the other side of that is having something, a tool, a, a practice, a guideline that can be put in place that is actionable, that's, that is implementable, that it's not, well, it would be great if, if you did it like this, but, but having things that people can act on because yeah, people, people like to act in their own interest. <laughs> That makes a lot of sense. I like that action. Oh, we've got a few more questions. Let's see. Um, someone asked, um, they were looking at jrost.org and was wondering how this group was being marketed to librarians. I honestly don't know. I've seen it come up in a few different ways, but never really within the, the library space necessarily. And it might be worthwhile um, thinking about how to connect with them to bring them kind of into the library conversation a little bit more, a little bit more strongly. Um, because you're, you're right, they, they don't have a lot of presence in, in that space. So I, 
it might be something, I mean, this is a great platform for talking with librarians. Maybe they would be a good candidate at some point down the, the line to, to come and talk to this audience as well about what they're trying to achieve and how they're trying to achieve it and um, how libraries can be key partners for them in, in getting the message out to universities and also tailoring um, some of the tools and some of the ways of thinking so that it, it, it is available to researchers in, and more easily accessible to institutions. Yes, and that's the joint roadmap for open science tools. And great, thank you, Jessica, good question. Um, and we have, oh, well, here's one more question too. Um, on the topic of the reluctant partners, which I, I think we all face, how have you handled the issue of people wanting to do things specifically their way? Heard, like scientists can be very sensitive about their autonomy. Speaking about my own institution, the author said. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, I, yes, it is your experience, but, but I have also had that experience. Uh, researchers are rightly sensitive about the knowledge that they have gained about their research and their practices. They are the experts on their research field for the most part. Um, and being specific about wanting to do it their way, that isn't that isn't in and of itself an issue, right? It's what are the what are the results? Of, of doing it their way and helping being a, a, a thinking partner about you know so it you know if, if you want to do it thus and so okay can you talk to me a little bit about why it is that that works for you what makes it beneficial for you to do it that way and drawing out some of the uh, perhaps uh, unintentional add-on effects of doing it in a specific way, in a way that isn't, you know, a critique or finding fault necessarily, but just broadening the field of vision about the impact that these decisions have. Um, not that the decisions are wrong, the decisions may be absolutely right for that point uh, in time with their research, but then bringing in other perspectives that say, well, if, if you want to do your thing this way, but you would also like to achieve this goal, maybe adding this in or adding this step on can help you achieve both of those things where you can still keep on doing it your way, but also achieve this goal with this one change or with an added tool, or just maybe even with an added field in a spreadsheet or on a database or something like that. But it is really, in my experience, I found it really is about having that conversation and, and understanding why. The, what, what is the benefit that the researcher is realizing from making that choice to do it in that specific way? And where can we work with the researcher so they can still realize that benefit or perhaps even realize a greater benefit? Um. And we have one additional question so far. What is an example of actionable guidance that you leave collaborators with? Oh, that so depends on the collaborator. And I think the uh, one of the easiest answers here is, so this is how you should rename your files. <laughs> and here's, a, here's a, a massive file renaming application that you can use. <laughs> Uh, so just helping them come up with a, a structure of renaming your files, right? Or saying, here's a basic structure for a readme file. Just fill in these fields and you'll have better documentation than the no documentation that you had before. So some of those just basic, basic practices that, that we think of as a matter of course can help out immensely. Um, I think I saw someone comment the other day that the best thing that anyone could ever do for researchers is teach them how to use spreadsheets well. And I think that's a really good point. So much, we like to, big data is fun and flashy and it's exciting, but we have a lot more data and research efforts that are really wrapped up in spreadsheets. And so just, you know, the concept of tidy data 
and how to straighten out a spreadsheet that is full of merged cells and color-coded values and put that in a form that makes it tidy data that can be converted to a CSV that makes it interoperable that you can actually extract things with is also another piece of useful, actionable advice that people can take on right away. Also backups, never underestimate the value of backups. Yes, and and please keep those questions coming. Sure. I, um, I guess in the meantime, well, we have just a few more minutes, but I liked how you said um, to kind of, in, in relation to people doing things their own specific way, um, it's nice to look at the results of doing it their way. And it made me think, uh, often the results may not be what we anticipated, but they actually may not be, um, they, they might have a, they might still be positive and work well. Um, and that's kind of interesting. So just then maybe even in regards to the metadata, things like that for data management. Um, I don't know if you've noticed that, but um, we ha we've had a lot of push and pull sometimes it seems like in different groups about we almost want to add so much so many different metadata fields and yet we're not really sure the discipline so if that makes sense kind of a question. I think you're yeah I think I think you're absolutely right is is that while we are information professionals Ultimately, the researchers are the experts in their field, and, and they understand, to some extent, their discipline and the expectations of the discipline. Um, and so knowing, for, as you point out, what metadata fields other people might actually find useful. And these can vary a lot, even within even within a, a discipline, when you start getting into subdisciplines, you know what what do this what what does this area of research actually care about? And it might be some some field or some variable that you know I've never heard of certainly, and so I, I wouldn't have considered putting it in. And they could they could not care less about you know something that I would have traditionally thought would be a more valuable point of metadata. So so yes, listening to and, and honoring the experience and the expertise that our researchers have developed in, in their field, I, I think is, is an appropriate way to approach that partnership just as much as we want them to respect our expertise and what we're talking about. Oh, and I'm very glad Courtney has asked this. Uh, but that's, I was also interested in this. Um, you talked about a registry of the data produced on campus, as well as a resource with all of the data resources accessible from a physical space, um, which, and Courtney um, asks, makes her think about that would be a good first step for many institutions, um, would be inventorying those data and resources on campus which could also serve as an outreach mechanism and build connections with faculty and IT, for example. And does that align with your approach? Great question, Courtney. Thank you, Courtney, for that. Um, it, it is trying to bring a lot of those different strands together, definitely. Uh, the physical space is the, um, it is that GIS and data lab space, right? And whether or not all of the data resources would be accessible from there is a question uh, because we don't know where all of those data resources might end up being. And it, it could well be that, that some of them uh, sit in restricted places and, and things like that. Um, but, but yes, that's, that's a very good way to think about that. And we do hope that inventorying the data and the resources on campus is a point where we can profile what the library does in the space of research data as a part of information that is such an intrinsic part of the research record and so part of the library's purview. Um, and the, the connections with the faculty and with IT go to not just because uh, 
maybe, well, for a lot of researchers, the library isn't a place that they go to because they can get everything from their computer that the library provides. But creating that physical space for resources they don't have readily accessible, if those are something like compute resources or special equipment, um, creates that, that draw back to the library and that opportunity to have those consultations and, and talk about what are the other resources that are available across the campus, across the institution. Thank you so much. I have just a couple of minutes if there's any more questions. Well, this has this has been really great, and thank you to everyone, and especially to our presenter. I know I'll probably share all of our participants and say we've learned so much, so we really appreciate it. And if there's any other housekeeping or anything, Leah. I'm just going to unmute myself. This is Courtney, and I wasn't able to be here right in the beginning, but Amy, thank you so much. This has been fantastic. My pleasure. Thank you for the invitation again. It was it was lovely, lovely to be able to talk about some of these ideas. And, and really, I am interested in hearing back from the community about the different experiences that, that you've had. And, and seriously, if anyone is building one of those data registry things, would love to talk to you about that. Okay, well, thank you all so much. Um, have a wonderful rest of the day. Thanks again, Amy. Thank you. Have a great rest of your day. Bye.